Welcome to another episode of the History Podcast. Today we are heading to the far frosty north of Europe. We will build our drakkar from freshly cut trees and set off into the raging seas. We will sail out of our tiny settlements located under fog and fjords and go to conquer distant lands. I warn you, not everyone will be able to return from this journey. We will make weapons for battle and stand shoulder to shoulder with the berserkers, ready to move to eternity. Together, we will remove rune stones in honor of great warriors and bury them with all their honors so that they will sit with the gods in Valhalla. We will dive into the family life of the Vikings, their clothes, agriculture and entertainment that accompanied them in the evenings. I will tell you more than one Norse saga, taking you into the world of Scandinavian mythology. You will learn all the most interesting things about the Vikings. Take a sip of honey, put on your helmets and let Odin protect us. What comes to mind when you think of the Vikings in popular imagination? The Viking is, above all, the quintessence of barbarianism and bloody conquests led by uncouth blondes in helmets and horns. Well, those are popular modern concepts of the Vikings. They are very different from the complex picture that emerges from archaeology and historical sources. The perception of the Vikings as powerful pirate pagans and intrepid adventurers is the product of many conflicting variations of the Viking mythos and took shape in the early 20th century. Current popular depictions of the Vikings are usually based on cultural stereotypes which complicates the objective perception of the heritage of these Norse conquerors. Don't worry though, after listening to this podcast, you'll be true experts in the field. Where did the term Viking come from? We all use this term almost intuitively, but where did it come from? Well, even that is a mystery to us. One of the theories looks for the origin of the word wiki, which means a cove or a small bay. The word Viking may be derived from the name of the historical Norwegian Wigan area. Viking would therefore mean a person from Wigan. According to this theory, though, the word originally referred to people from only this area, and only in the last few centuries did it take on the broader meaning of Scandinavians in general. However, there are several problems with this theory. The people of the area were never called Vikings in Old Norse manuscripts, but they are referred to as the inhabitants of the wiki. Moreover, this theory only explains the masculine and not the feminine gender of the word Viking. The word Viking also appears as a name on some Swedish rune stones. The Toki Viking stone was erected in memory of a local man named Toki, who was named Toki Viking. The stone in Gradestanga refers to people known to be Vikings. The Vastrastro runestone was also found, which has an inscription commemorating a man killed during a Viking raid. The stone Brio was erected in memory of the Asura, who protected this land from the Vikings. Another mythology that gained support in the early 21st century is derived from the same root as the Old Norse word Wicca. Wicca meant nautical mile, and originally, Wicca was the distance between two changes of oarsmen. In other words, the word Viking may come from the term from a process when a tired oarsman lay down on his side and the other replaced him at that time. This would mean that the Old Norse meaning of Viking was originally a sea voyage characterized by the shifting of the oarsmen. This is a long distance journey because in that era there was a distinction between journeys that required a change of oarsmen and shorter ones. The Kingel, which is the masculine form of the word Viking, originally meant a participant in such a sea voyage, which was characterized by the displacement of the rowers. But how did other cultures relate to the Vikings? In Old English, the word Weising originally appears in an Anglo-Saxon poem, which dates back to the 9th century AD. In Old English and in the history of the bishops of Hamburg and Bremen, written by Adam of Bremen, the term referred to Scandinavian pirates or raiders. In Old Norse customs, the term was not used as a name for any people or culture in general. The word did not occur in any surviving texts in Central England, and the word Viking was not introduced in modern English until the 18th century. However, the so-called awakening of Viking knowledge took shape when the Viking as a character took on a heroic tone as a warrior and noble savages. The Vikings were known by Germans as Ascomanians or Ashmen due to the ash coming from the Viking ship and also as people of the lake by the Gauls. The Slavs, Arabs and Byzantines knew the Vikings as Rus or Rosans, and the word probably comes from different uses of the word Ro, meaning to row. 
Currently, some archaeologists and historians believe that these Scandinavian settlements on Slavic lands played a significant role in the formation of the Kivian Rus Federation, and thus the names and early states of Russia and Belarus. The Slavs and Byzantines called the Vikings Wara Giants. This word comes from the Russian word Varjaji and from the Old Norse, we ringjar, and means sworn people, self-confidence, vows of allegiance. The Franks usually called the Vikings Northmen and the English Irish pagans. As you can see, the common denominator of these investigations is a reference to the travel or geographical regions or ships. But why exactly did the Vikings set out from home? Much of the Vikings' history is told in sagas, which, while not entirely accurate, still provide us with more information than what we know about medieval Europe. Sagas are old Scandinavian epics about legendary or historical heroes and imminent countrymen, as well as Viking expeditions and migrations. It is from these sagas that we know, for example, that the Vikings reached Iceland, Greenland, and even discovered North America before Columbus did. According to the Icelandic sagas, Eric the Red, who lived between the years 950 and 1003, founded the first colony in Greenland. Eric the Red's son, Leif Eriksson, who lived between 970 and 1020, founded the first European settlement on continental North America, which he named Vinland. We know where the Vikings traveled, but do we know why they went on such long journeys? The short answer is no. We only have hypotheses. One theory is that the warming that took place on the European continent in the 7th century and later allowed Viking ships to make longer journeys than before as sea ice previously blocked them from further waters. Researchers have suggested that the Vikings may have started sailing and raiding because of the need to seek women from foreign lands. This view was expressed as early as the 11th century by the medieval historian Saint Quentin in his semi-imaginary history of the Normans. Wealthy, powerful Viking men had many wives and concubines, and these relationships could lead to a lack of eligible women for the average man. As a result, the average Viking male was forced to take more risky steps to gain wealth and power in order to find the right woman. In this example, it is clear that polygamous marriages increase competition among men in society, creating a group of unmarried men who willingly engage in risky behaviors to increase their status. This is supported by chronicles such as the Ulster Chronicles, which state that in 821, the Vikings plundered an Irish village and carried away large numbers of women into slavery. Another example is that the Vikings took advantage of a moment of weakness in the surrounding regions. England at the beginning of the Middle Ages suffered from internal divisions and was a relatively easy target given the proximity of many cities to the sea or navigable rivers. The lack of organized naval opposition across Europe allowed Viking ships to travel freely, raid and trade. The fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century, when the profitability of the old trade routes fell, may have also played a role. Trade between Western Europe and the rest of Eurasia then suffered a severe blow. The expansion of Islam in the 7th century was also significant. The invasions in Europe were not unprecedented and took place long before the Vikings arrived. For example, the Jutes, or Germanic people, invaded the British Isles three centuries earlier than the Vikings. The Saxons did the same from continental Europe, but the Viking raids were the first to be documented in writing by eyewitnesses, and their scale and frequency were much greater than before. The era of raiding and plundering European countries began exactly on June 8, 793 AD. It was then that the monastery of Lindensfarne, located on a small island off the coast of northeast England, was looted and destroyed. In the chronicles, this event was mentioned, which adequately illustrates the fear of the inhabitants of this invasion, especially the monks. The attack is described in connection with terrible signs that were supposed to announce it and appear in the sky. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the Viking invasion was preceded by a powerful storm with great lightning. Giant whirlwinds raged in the air. The terrified inhabitants also mentioned that fire-breathing dragons were supposed to fly in the sky. These terrible signs were followed by a period of great famine and the Viking raids began. Soon, they repeated almost every day and became very strong. This raid on Lindensfarne took place on a summer morning on June 793. 
it was conducted from the sea, and to the front-looking inhabitants, the Viking boats, whose decorative prows depicted dragons, snakes, and other reptiles, resembled fairy tale monsters from forgotten legends, floating with fierce fury on the waves of the sea. On each boat sat several dozen armed men in armor and helmets with swords and axes strapped to their sides. Their shields in long rows adorned the sides of the boat they were sailing on. Convinced of the good intentions of the newcomers, the monks did not even suspect that they were in mortal danger. Confident in the teachings of the church, they greeted the guests with a smile and the word of God on their lips. But they made a mistake that cost them the highest price. For the Vikings, the attack gave the opportunity to gain glory in battle, and above all, it was an excellent opportunity to acquire substantial treasures. The Vikings carried out the invasion extremely audaciously and struck with great impetus and aggression. They cut and hacked in all directions, and severed heads and other body parts flew around, gushing with guises of human gore. Screams, cries, and pleas for mercy of the murdered monks could be heard from everywhere, and the sky was pierced by the sound of broken bones and the splash of shoes dirting and puddles of blood. All Vikings followed the sacred formula of the northern warriors. Hegre Eki Higi Ask, or Hit and Don't Think, which they treated as the highest military sanctity. After the slaughter, the invaders plundered the corpses of all ornaments, coins and other valuables, then ran towards the gates of the monastery, which had not been locked and stood open. No longer stopped by anyone, they ran inside without mercy or fear. Norman warriors slaughtered everything that got in their way. From all the slaughter, no one survived except a few young monks who were taken prisoner. After the fight, all the valuable things were plundered, such as gold, jewels, food and wine, and the rest was burnt and reduced to ashes so that not a single stone was left of the Lindisfarne household. At the end, the warlike people shouted many times the praise and joy of the victory won, the acquisition of huge treasures. With a song on their lips in the glory of victory, the warriors returned to their homeland to where their families were waiting. A few weeks later, the Christian part of Europe was preceded by the terrible news of the barbaric attack of the godless, their bestial murder of innocent Christians, and of the looting and burning of the Lindisfarne Monastery. The Christians of that time were convinced that the cruel murder of the believing brothers was God's punishment for their sinful lives. The thesis about these beliefs is confirmed in many letters from that period. One of the scholars of the time, Lucan of York, acting as the superior of the court of Emperor Charlemagne, was shocked by the fact that he just sent such letters in which he additionally admonished believers to observe the rules of virtuous life in order to avoid God's punishment, which must have been expressed by Viking attacks. Lucan also wrote to Ethelred, the king of Nordrumbia, the land where Lindensfarne was located, and he wrote, Consider that for 350 years, we and our ancestors lived in this beautiful country, and never has so wicked a deed been done in Britain as the last done to us by imperious people. No one would have believed until now that such a vile act was even possible. The holy church is stained with the blood of God's servants and stripped of all its valuables. The place for all in Britain is held in the highest esteem, but it is desecrated by pagans. The extract from the letter shows how despicable the attack on the abbey was in the eyes of the contemporary inhabitants of civilized Europe and how much it left a mark on their conscience. The Viking invasion was a surprise to all the civilized countries of Europe. None of them was able to oppose them effectively, nor did any of them escape attack and looting. The attack on Lindensfarne in 793 was the first expedition of Norman warriors on such a scale, and it began a more than 250 50-year series of similar invasions. From then on, all the inhabitants on the coastal towns and villages, as well as those inland where the Viking boats came down the river, were afraid of these people. From that moment, for over two and a half centuries, the Vikings were the terror of all Western Europe, which could not effectively repel their invasions. Their prey fell not only to coastal settlements, but also Paris, Rome, London and many other cities, often located far inland. Okay, so where did the Vikings go? 
First they colonized Iceland in the 9th century, then they reached Greenland, then the Northern Islands and the North Atlantic coast. They also ventured as far south as North Africa and east of Constantinople, Russia and the Middle East. They raided, looted, traded, acted as mercenaries and settled vast colonies. Previously, the Vikings were probably returning home after their raids, but later they began to settle in other lands. Vikings, led by Lif Erikson, the son of Erik the Red, reached North America and established short-lived settlements in the modern Lance O' Meadows in Newfoundland, Canada. Scandinavian men and women traveled to many parts of Europe and beyond in a cultural journey that left traces from Newfoundland to Byzantium. This period of activity also had a clear impact on the Scandinavian homelands, which were subject to various new cultural influences. And in the 300 years from the late 8th century, when modern chronicles first wrote about the arrival of the Viking invaders, Scandinavia underwent profound cultural changes by the end of the 11th century. At the end of the 11th century, the royal dynasties were legitimized by the Catholic Church, which until 300 years earlier had little influence in Scandinavia and increased their power with authority and ambition, and the three kingdoms of Denmark, Norway and Sweden took shape. Cities emerged that acted as secular administrative centers and markets and monetary economies began to emerge based on English and German models. At the same time, Christianity took root in Denmark and Norway and the new religion began to be better organized and strengthened in Sweden. Foreign clergy and native elites vigorously supported the interest of Christianity and the old ideology and way of life began to change. By the year 1100, the first archbishop in Scandinavia was founded in the city of Lund, which was part of Denmark. So how did these changes go? For example, let's take slavery. One of the Vikings' many sources of raiding was the acquisition of slaves. The medieval church held that Christians should not have fellow believers as slaves, and so the shape of slavery was declining throughout the practice of Northern Europe. This removed much of the economic incentive from raiding, but sporadic slavery continued well into the 11th century. The kings of Norway still held power in the northern part, in Great Britain and Ireland, and the invasions continued in the 12th century, but the military ambitions of Scandinavian rulers were now set on a new path. In 1107, Sigurd I of Norway sailed to the East Mediterranean with the Norwegian Crusaders to fight for the newly created Kingdom of Jerusalem. The Danes and Swedes vigorously participated in the Baltic Crusades in the 12th and 13th centuries. And thus, the savage Vikings finally civilized themselves. This is how these legendary epic sea voyages ended, as they simply stopped paying off. Various sources teach us a lot about the Vikings' culture, activities and beliefs, although the Vikings were an illiterate culture that produced no literary heritage. They did have an alphabet and depicted their world on rune stones. Most modern literary and written sources come from other cultures that had contact with the Vikings. Archaeological research has been intensely conducted since the mid-20th century and gives us a fuller and more balanced picture of Viking life. The records are particularly rich and diverse, providing knowledge on their rural and urban settlements, craftsmanship and production of ships and military equipment, trade networks as well as their pagan and Christian religious artifacts and practices. The most important sources of knowledge about the Vikings are contemporary texts from Scandinavia and regions where the Vikings were active. Latin was introduced to Scandinavia with Christianity, so there are a few Scandinavian documentary resources before the late 11th and early 12th centuries. Scandinavians wrote inscriptions in runes, but they are usually very short. Most contemporary documentary sources consist of texts written in Christian communities and Islamic texts that are written outside of Scandinavia, often by authors who were affected by the activities of the Vikings in a negative sense. For example, they fell victim to their raids. Many traditions related to the Viking Age were recorded for the first time in the Icelandic sagas. The literal interpretation of these medieval narratives about the Vikings and their past is questionable, but many individual elements merit attention, such as the vast quantity of skaldic poetry attributed to poets of the 10th and 11th centuries, exposed family trees, images and the ethical values in the literature. And these sagas were really interesting, by the way. I will now read you a piece of the saga about Eric Redbeard. Let's feel together the climate of traveling and settling in wild, inaccessible places. 
Carl Swemi sailed south along the shore with Snorri and Bjarni and the rest of their companions. They had been sailing for a long time when they saw a river that flowed first into a lake and then into the sea. There were such great shallows that it was possible to enter only at full tide. They found fields of wild wheat and wild vines growing on the hills. Every stream was full of fish. They dug ditches where the tide washed over the land, and when the water receded in the ditches, the fish were left behind. Lots of animals lived in the forests. They stayed there for two weeks, seeing nothing and no one. They had their cattle there. It happened one morning that they noticed nine leather boats in the water, on which boards were being waved and the sound was if someone was threshing grain. What could that mean? Carl Swemi asked. Perhaps it's a peace sign, replied Snorri. Let's take the white shield and show it to them. He did so, and the strangers landed on the shore and disembarked from the ships. They were short, ugly people with ugly hair on their heads and big eyes and broad cheeks. They called them Creelings. They remained there for a while, then sailed away, rowing over the cape to the south. Carl Swemi and his men built themselves on the lake. Some houses were built inland, others on the entire lake. They spent the whole winter there. There was no snow, and the animals were grazing by themselves. But with the advent of spring one morning, they saw a multitude of leather boats sailing across the cape to the south. There were so many of them that it seemed as if the gulf was covered with coal. Again, planks were waved from each ship. Carl Swemi and his men raised their shield and began to trade with the newcomers. These men above all desired to buy red cloth and had the hides and grey furs of animals in exchange. They also wanted to buy swords and spears, but the Vikings would not allow it. The Vikings have given us insight into their language, culture and activities through the many old Norse names and words found in their former sphere of influence. Some of these locations and words are still in use almost unchanged today and shed light on where they settled and what the place meant to them. Places such as Eggersley, which means the island of Egila, Orum's Kirk, Snailfell for snowfall, and Ravenscar, which means Raven's Stone, Windland, which means Land of Wine, or even Thorshaven, which means Port of Thor. It's all the Viking influence that comes through in such concepts. And this culture of the Vikings was translated into the language of the lands they traveled to. Common words in everyday English, such as the name of some days, like Thursday for Thor's Day, but also axe, raft, knife, leather, window, husband, heaven and hell. All these words that come from Old Norse and give us the opportunity to understand the interaction of cultures with the cultures of British Isles. In the northern Shetland Islands, Old Norse has completely replaced local languages and some modern words and names appear and contribute to our understanding after more intensive study of linguistic sources such as York, which comes from Horse Bay. Researchers have also determined that the Normandy town of Tokyville means Toki's farm. Linguistic and entomological studies are a very important source of information about Vikings' culture, social structure and history, and how they interacted with the people and cultures they encountered, traded with, attacked or lived with. Many Old Norse connections are also seen in modern Swedish, Norwegian, Danish and Icelandic. Interestingly, Old Norse did not have a great influence on the Slavic languages. It is speculated that the reason was the great difference between these two languages and also the much more peaceful interests of the Russian Vikings in these areas and the fact that their numbers here were simply much smaller. The fact is that much more is known about the Vikings in Western Europe than in Eastern Europe. The Vikings could read and write and use a non-standard runic alphabet built from sound values. While there are a few runic writings left on paper from the Viking Age, we have something more unusual. 1,000 stones with different inscriptions found in places where Vikings lived. They are usually dedicated to the memory of the dead, although not necessarily placed at the graves. These stones look like grey blocks, usually one and a half meters long, covered with runes and drawings, usually in red paint. Most of the rune stones from the Viking period are found in Sweden and date back to the 11th century. The oldest stone with various inscriptions was found in Norway and dates back to the 4th century. 
Many rune stones in Scandinavia record the names of participants in Viking expeditions, such as the Kiula rune stone, which tells of extensive warfare in Western Europe, and also the Turinga rune stone, which tells of a war band in Eastern Europe. Other rune stones mention men who died during Viking expeditions, among them some 25 Ingwar rune stones in the Swedish district of Maladaren, laid down to commemorate members of the disastrous expedition to present-day Russia that took place in the early 11th century. Rune stones are important sources in the study of Norse society and early medieval Scandinavia. And not just the Viking population. Not all the stones we've discovered, for example, the Jelling stones, dated back to 960 to 985. The oldest, smallest stone was brought down by King Gorman the Old, the past pagan king of Denmark, as a memorial to the Queen of Tyre. The larger stone was erected by his son Harold to celebrate the conquest of Denmark-Norway and the conversion of the Danes to Christianity. By analyzing the rune stones, we can confirm travels to places such as Greece, Jerusalem, Italy, England, as well as places in Eastern Europe. The tracks also lead to the Isle of Man. All right, let's talk about Viking burial places. There are many Viking-related burial sites across Europe and spheres of influence in Scandinavia, the British Isles, Ireland, Greenland, Iceland and the Faroe Islands, Germany, the Baltic and Russia. Viking burial practices varied greatly, from dug graves in the earth to mound construction and sometimes ship burial. According to written sources, most funerals took place at sea. Funerals included burial or cremation, depending on local customs. In what is now Sweden, cremations predominated, while funerals were more common in Denmark and both were practiced in Norway. Gifts were often left for the deceased. Both men and women were given a grave, even if the corpse was to be burnt at the stake. The king could also be buried with a loved one or a domestic slave or cremated together on a funeral prior. The quantity and value of goods left as a gift depended on the social group of the deceased. It was important to bury the dead in the right way so that they could join the afterlife with the same social standing they had in life and that they do not become a homeless soul who is condemned to eternal wandering. It is not known how the Vikings buried their children. What we do know is how they buried slaves, and a slave's grave is a little more than a hole in the ground. Slaves were buried in such a way as to ensure that they would not return to persecute their masters and that they would be of use to them after their deaths. The free man was usually given weapons and riding equipment to his grave. A craftsman like the blacksmith could receive a whole set of tools. Women received jewelry and often household tools. The most lavish Viking funeral to date was that of the Osberg ship, which was dedicated to a woman, possibly a queen or priestess, who lived in the 9th century AD. These sacrificed goods not only symbolized the status of the deceased, but also represented key moments or successes in the individual's life. Certain numbers of weapons, such as the amount of arrows, could indicate a range of combat abilities. The amount of grave goods varied, which means that burial practices could be adapted under the influence of new cultures. While some factors, such as animal motifs among relic jewelry, remained universal throughout Viking culture, some items differed due to other cultural influences. A typical example is the interference of Christian iconology in jewelry, especially the burying of the dead with crosses. The method of burial of the Vikings was a ship burial, in which a vessel or a boat served as a grave for the deceased. Such a ship, together with the deceased, was sent out to sea on an eternal journey. Is there any more majestic symbol of the Vikings than their ships? Powerful, raw and formidable. Many archaeological finds of Viking ships show a whole range of ship sizes and give us knowledge of the craftsmanship and how they were built, as well as the type of ships. There were a great many of them built for a variety of uses. The most famous type was probably the Langskip or Longship. Longships were intended for warfare. For exploration activities, they were designed for speed and agility and were equipped with oars to complement the sail, allowing navigation regardless of the wind. The Langskip had a long, narrow hull and a shallow draft to facilitate beach landings and shallow water troop deployments. Langskips were extensively used by the lairds, such as Scandinavian defense fleets. Langships facilitated long-distance voyages. But as I mentioned, the Vikings built many other types of ships. For example, 
example, the Canar, a dedicated merchant ship designed to carry bulk cargo, had a wide hull, a deep draft and a small number of oars. Mainly used for maneuvering in ports and similar situations, one of the innovations of the Canars was the girders mounted on the sail, which allowed these ships to sail efficiently against the wind. Viking seafaring ships often towed or carried a smaller boat that was used to transfer crew and cargo from ship to shore. But the most interesting, in my opinion, was the Draka, which is the largest type of langskips. The largest known Draka was 45 meters long and had 34 pairs of oars. There may have been larger Drakas with legends suggesting up to 120 places for rowers. According to Scandinavian sagas, the Danish king Canute the Great owned such a ship. Generally, Drakas included vessels with at least 60 oars. Reconstructed in 1881 in Norway, the Drakkar was 25 meters long, 5 meters wide and had 16 oars. Drakkars were vessels capable of ocean and river navigation. They were equipped with one large cruising sail which had over 230 meters squared of surface area. As large vessels, Drakkars were expensive and usually owned by chieftains, serving as representative ships in Norman fleets. A characteristic feature of the Drakars was sculptures depicting the heads of dragons attached to the stem during expeditions, hence the name of these units. These sculptures served to scare off the deities, taking care of the attacked cities, and were removed during the return so as not to offend their own guards. Ships were an integral part of Viking culture, facilitating daily transportation across seas and waterways, exploration of new lands, raids, conquests and trade with neighboring cultures. People of high status and great religious importance were sometimes buried along with a whole ship with animal sacrifices, weapons, supplies and other items, as evidenced by the buried vessels in Gokstad and Ostberg, Norway. Ship burials were practiced by the Vikings abroad, as evidenced by the excavations in Selma ships on the Estonian island of Sarma. Well-preserved remains of five Viking ships were excavated from the Roskilde Fjord in the late 60s of the 20th century, and it contained both a longship and a canard. The ships were sunk there in the 11th century to block the navigation canal and thus protect Roskilde, which was then the Danish capital from a naval attack. The remains of these ships can be seen at the Viking Ship Museum in Roskilde. Okay, so Viking society was divided into three social and economic classes. Trals or slaves, Karls and Jarls. This is clearly described in the poem Rik's Bully, which explains that God Rik, the father of mankind, also called Heimdlar, created the three classes. Archaeology confirms the social structure. Slaves were the lowest ranks and made up a quarter of the population. Slavery was essential to Viking society for daily chores and large-scale construction as well as trade and the economy. Slaves were servants and laborers on farms in large houses of the Karls and Jarls and were used to build fortifications, canals, ramps, roads, mounds and similar hard work. From where the slaves were taken, either they were born as sons and daughters of current slaves or they were rounded up abroad. The Vikings often deliberately captured many people when invading Europe to enslave them for their own use. The slaves were then brought back to Scandinavia or used on the spot. The Karls were free peasants. They owned farms, land and cattle and did everyday chores such as plowing their cattle fields, building houses, but they also used slaves to make ends meet. Another term for Karls is bonda, or simply free man. The Jarls were the aristocracy of Viking society. They were wealthy and had large estates and huge houses, horses and many slaves. Their slaves performed most of the daily duties, while the Jarls themselves took care of administration, politics, hunting, sports, visiting other Jarls or being abroad on expeditions. When a Jarl died, his slaves were ritually killed and buried next to him as many archaeological excavations reveal. In everyday life, there were many intermediate positions in the general social structure of the Vikings. It is believed that there must have been social mobility. These details are obscure, but titles and social positions such as Hautler, Tegen and Landmann suggest mobility between Karls and Jarls. In other words, you could move up the social ladder, but you could also go down. What was life like for women in Viking society? Women had a 
relatively free status in the Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Denmark and Norway, as illustrated by the Icelandic Gragas, a collection of local laws as well as Norwegian laws. One such law indicates that a paternal aunt, paternal niece and paternal granddaughter have the right to inherit property from a deceased man in the absence of male relatives. An unmarried woman without a son could inherit not only the property but also the position of the head of the family after the deceased father or brother. Such a woman was called a Balgriger and exercised all the rights granted to the head of the family clan. This included the right to demand and receive fines for the slaughter of a family member. After the age of 20, an unmarried woman referred to as Mary reached the age of majority and had the right to decide upon the place of residence and in general make decisions about themselves. The exception to her independence was the right to choose her marriage mate because Viking marriages were usually arranged by the family. Studies of Viking age burials suggest that women lived longer and almost all were over 35 when they died. Viking women most often gave birth between the ages of 20 and 35 because then the largest population of them died most likely due to childbirth complications. Widows had the same independent status as unmarried women. A married woman could divorce her husband and remarry. It was also socially acceptable for a free woman to live with a man and have children with him without marriage even if this man was married. The woman in this position was called Frilla. No distinction was made between children born in wedlock and those born out of wedlock, each of whom had their right to inherit his parents' property. There were no legitimate or illegitimate children. Women had religious authority and acted as priestesses. Oracles also functioned in the arts as poets and rune masters and as merchants and priestesses. It was also possible that they were also active in military officers. Stories of shield maids or female warriors are unconfirmed, but also archaeological finds as well as Viking warrior Birka may indicate that at least some women were active in military authorities. These women gradually disappeared after the introduction of Christianity and from the end of the 13th century. So what did the Vikings eat and grow? The sagas tell of the Vikings' diet and cuisine, but it was first-hand evidence, such as excavated barn pantries, kitchens and garbage dumps, that proved to be of great value and importance. In recent decades, archaeobotanical research has been increasingly undertaken. This new scientific historical approach sheds light on the Vikings' agricultural and horticultural practices and their cuisine. A variety of meat products of all kinds were prepared and eaten, such as cured smoked meat and cured whey, sausages and cooked or fried pieces of fresh meat. The Vikings ate a lot of seafood, bread, cereals, dairy products, but also vegetables, fruit, berries and nuts. And what did the Vikings drink? Alcoholic beverages such as beer, mead, a strong fruit wine, as well as imported wines were served. Some farm animals were typical and unique to the Vikings, such as Icelandic hoss, Icelandic cattle, many breeds of sheep, Danish hens and Danish goose, but York Vikings mostly ate beef, mutton and pork, sometimes also horse meat. The Vikings liked to eat bone marrow, which is evident by sword beef and horse bones that were found. Mutton and pigs were cut along the joints and shoulder blades. Chickens were kept both for their meat and their eggs, but also black grouse, wild ducks and geese were bred. The Vikings liked seafood in some places even more than meat. Whales and walruses were hunted for food in Norway and the northwestern part of the North Atlantic region, and seals were hunted almost everywhere. Oysters, mussels and shrimp were eaten in large quantities, and cod and salmon were very popular fish. In the southern regions, herring was also consumed. When it comes to dairy, milk and buttermilk were very popular both as cooking ingredients and as drinking beverages, although it was not always available, even on farms. The milk came from cows, goats and sheep, and fermented milk products were also produced as well as butter and cheese. The Vikings liked salt as the food was often heavily salted and also spiced. Some of them were imported like black pepper. Other spices were grown in herb gardens or harvested in the wild. Homemade condiments included cumin, mustard and horseradish, dill, coriander and wild celery as well as thyme and juniper berry.
The Vikings not only hunted, they gathered and ate fruits, berries and nuts, as well as apples, plums and cherries. They were a regular part of their diet. Just like rose hips and raspberries, along with wild berries, blackberries, elderberries, rowan berries and hawthorn, they also liked hazelnuts. The invention and introduction of the plough revolutionized agriculture in Scandinavia and made it possible to cultivate even poor soils. Grains of rye, barley, oats and wheat have been found dating as far back as the 8th century and are believed to have been locally grown grains and flour used to make porridges. Some were cooked with milk, some were cooked with fruit and sweetened with honey and various baked forms of bread. However, the quality of food for ordinary people was not always particularly high. Research shows that, for example, both wheat and rye seeds were used to make bread, but also weed seeds from cornfields. Moreover, the grit stones that were used to grind these seeds left little stone fragments in the flour, which, when eaten, damaged the teeth. The effects of these stones on the teeth can be seen in the skeletons of that period. The Vikings enjoyed sports competitions. These sports were often military in nature, involving training in the use of weapons and the development of combat skills. Examples included spear and stone throwing, as well as tests of physical strength, such as wrestling, fist fighting and lifting stones. But there were also many other sporting competitions in mountainous areas. Mountaineering was practiced as a sport. Agility and balance were built and tested by running and jumping. And the sagas also mentioned the sport which consisted of jumping from one oar to the other outside the railing of the ship while it sailed. Swimming was also a popular sport which included diving, swimming for long distances and something like tag in the water. Children often took part in some sports, and women were also mentioned as swimmers, although it is unclear if they competed. King Olaf Tryggvason has been hailed as a master of both mountain climbing and rowing, and is said to have excelled in the art of knife juggling. Skiing and ice skating were the primary winter sports of the Vikings, though skiing was also used as a daily mode of transportation in the winter and in the colder regions of the north. Icelandic sources report that the sport of knatlek has emerged. It was a ball game similar to hockey. A small hard ball was needed to play on a smooth ice field, while its rules are unclear to us. Hunting became a sport, but only in Denmark, although it was not considered an important activity. Birds, deer, hares and foxes were hunted with a bow and spear and later with a crossbow. Hunting techniques consisted of tracking game using traps and with packs of dogs. Both archaeological finds and written sources testify that the Vikings liked to devote their free time to social and festive meetings. Board games and dice games were popular pastimes at all levels of society. Board games were made of readily available materials such as wood, stone and bones, while other finds include intricately carved boards and game pieces made of glass, amber, antler or even walrus skin, along with foreign materials such as ivory. The Vikings played several types of table games. Chess also appeared towards the end of the Viking Age. Time was also spent at Hemvatafel, a war game, the aim of which was to capture the king. One player plays the king's protection and two play the enemy army. The game was played on a board with squares using black and white pieces and making moves according to dice rolls. Even the Okolbo runestone has been preserved showing two men engaging in the game and the saga suggests that money and valuables were also part of some games. During festive occasions, people would sit down to feasts and enjoy stories, poetry and skaldic music. Alcoholic beverages such as beer and mead were also consumed, contributing to the jovial atmosphere. Music was considered an art form and musical proficiency was appropriate for a cultured man. The Vikings are known to play instruments including gaffs, fiddles, lyres and lutes. Let's talk about weapons and warfare. Knowledge about them is based on archaeological finds and on accounts of Norse sagas and Norse legislation from the 13th century. Accordingly, all free men were obliged to bear arms and could carry them at all times. The equipment indicated the social status of the Viking. A rich Viking had a helmet, a shield, chainmail and a sword. But swords were rarely used in battle. 
they were probably not strong enough for combat and were only used as symbolic or decorative items. The typical free man was more likely to fight with a spear and shield, and most also carried a utility knife called Sikhs. Bows were used in the early stages of land and sea battles, but the Vikings considered them less honorable than melee weapons. It was characteristic of the Vikings to use axes as their main combat weapon. Two-handed axes could easily destroy shields and metal helmets. The aggressive fighting style of the Vikings was motivated and driven by their beliefs in the Norse religion, which centered on Thor and Odin, the gods of war and death. In combat, it's believed that the Vikings often engaged in a disorderly style of frenzied furious moves called Berserk Gergang which led to them being called berserkers. Such tactics may have been deliberately used to shock troops, and a state of battle frenzy may have been induced by the use of psychoactive drugs such as mushrooms, hallucinogenic drugs, or large amounts of alcohol. Berserkers are interesting enough to deserve a separate note. In the Old Norse writings, berserkers were those who were said to fight in fury, a trait that later spawned the English word berserk, meaning furious, violence, or lack of control. Berserker is confirmed in numerous sources. The Old Norse form of the word was beserker. It probably meant bear shirts, as in someone who wears a bearskin cloak. The 13th century historian Snorri Sturluson interpreted the term as a bear shirt, implying that these warriors went into battle without any armor. But this view is modernly rejected. There are three types of berserkers in the sagas based on the cults of three brave animals, bear, wolf, and wild boar. Berserkers are bear warriors. Some authors suggest that the berserkers drew their power from the bear's strength and devoted themselves to the bear cult that was once widespread in the northern hemisphere. During battle, they would go berserk, howling like wild bears, foaming at the face and gnawing the iron edges of their shields. According to belief, during these attacks, they were immune to steel and fire, just like bears, and wrecked great havoc in the ranks of the enemy. When their fever subsided, they were weak and fearful. According to legend, they transformed into wild, furious beasts, specifically taking on the shape of a bear. One of the sagas tells the story of Bodwa Rabi Arki, who turned into a bear and used his ability to fight for the king. People have seen a great bear walk in front of King Rolf's men, always keeping close to them with his front paws, and has killed more people than any other man. Ulf Hednaus are wolf warriors appearing in the legends of Indo-Europeans, Turks, Mongols and Native Americans. They went into battle wearing the skins of wolves and were described as Odin's special troops. They went without their armor and raged like wolves, biting their shields, but neither fire nor iron affected them. One of the sagas also depicts Odin in the company of a warrior in wolf fur, wielding spears. The third type of berserkers were the Svilkfings, or boar warriors. In Norse mythology, the boar was a sacred animal. The mighty god Freyr owned a boar, while the goddess Freya owned a war pig. Boars can also be found on Swedish and Anglo-Saxon ceremonial items. They fought at the head of a battle formation known as a boar's head. This formation was wedge-shaped with two warriors forming a mouth. They were also described as masters of disguise and camouflage. At the same time, they had an excellent knowledge of the landscape. They used the strength of their boar animal as the basis of their martial art. The Vikings established extensive trade networks around the world and had a profound impact on the economic development of Europe and Scandinavia. With the exception of some centers where they traded, the Vikings world was unfamiliar with the use of coins and relied on the so-called bullion economy. Silver was the most common metal in the economy, although gold was also used to some extent. Silver circulated in the form of bars or spouts, as well as in the form of jewelry and ornaments. A large amount of silver hoards from the Viking Age have been discovered both in Scandinavia and the lands where they settled. Organized trade included everything from common produce to exotic luxury goods. So what did the Vikings import? mainly spices obtained from Chinese and Persian merchants who met the Vikings in Russia. The Vikings used domestic spices and herbs such as cumin, thyme, horseradish and mustard, but they imported cinnamon for example. 
Glass was also imported and was highly valued by the Nords. It was used to make beads of which 1,000 were found. Silk was also imported, which was an important commodity obtained from Byzantium and China. Silk was valued by many European cultures of the time, and the Vikings used it to show status, such as the wealth and nobility of a person wearing a silk garment. Many archaeological finds in Scandinavia reveal silk garments. Wine from France and Germany was also imported as a drink of the rich to diversify the regular consumption of beer. For balance, the Vikings exported many different goods. They sent amber, like fossilized pine resin, which was often found in the North Sea and the Baltic coast. Before being sold, amber was processed into beads and decorative items. Furs were also exported because they provided warmth. Fur from martens, foxes, bears, otters and beavers was obtained. The Vikings were skilled weavers and also exported high-quality woolen fabric. In addition, they traded fabrics and wool with other parts of the world. The Norwegian west coast supplied aided downs. Down was used to make bedding and quilted clothing. Down is obtained from the birds that settled on steep slopes and rocks, and harvesting was dangerous and often deadly work. The Vikings also sent slaves around the world during their raids. They captured many people, including monks and clergy, who were then sold in part to Arab merchants in exchange for silver. In addition, weapons, wax, salt and cod were exported. One of the more exotic exports were birds, which were sometimes supplied to the European aristocracy from the 10th century onwards. Wool was very important as a product for the Vikings. It was used to produce warm clothing for the cold Scandinavian climate and to make sails. Sails on Viking ships required large amounts of wool. In addition, craftsmen in large cities were supplied with antlers from organized hunts. These antlers were used as a raw material for making everyday utensils such as combs. Let's leave the mundane world for a moment and move to Norse mythology. The central element of Norse mythology is Voluspa, the story of the tree of life, Yggdrasil, which is a sacred tree. It is the axis and the place connecting all in common order in the cosmos. In the mythological song of Yggdrasil, the tree of life is destroyed by deers and serpents, symbolizing what is uncertain and dangerous. It details how Yggdrasil lives by the Norns that water the holy ash tree from the well Udran Brunnen. In Scandinavian mythology, Yggdrasil connects the nine worlds. Asgard is the home to the Aces. Vanaheim is home to the Vans. Alfheim is home to the Elves. Muskhalem is the land of fire. Nidavallr is the land of dwarfs. Niflheim is the world of ice, fog and the dead. Svatimthiem, the land of the dark elves. Jotunheim, the land of ice giants. And Midgard, the land of people, the land where they live until they die, including the Vikings. According to mythology, Midgard was created at the meeting point of the opposing worlds of water and fire. This is an extremely old myth of the Vedic tradition. In poetry, these two worlds are a source of danger. They even lead to destruction. Fire comes from Muspel and water from poisoned rivers, which is an example of a primitive understanding of good and evil in personifications and object metaphors. In this process, Emir was born, the ancestor of the giants, formidable for its size. He is mentioned in the comments as a character whose very existence is a danger. Fortunately, at his creation, Emir fell asleep and will remain in this state until his death. Emir embodies the forces of nature and is capable of self-birth. At the beginning of history, it gives birth to tersons and aces, such as gods and owls, who are the same substance as Emir, but are on the positive pole of history. In later history, the aces killed Emir, and from his body they created Midgard. And from the remnants of Emir, the aces created dwarfs. People, on the other hand, appeared spontaneously and were powerless. Midgard was originally a world of gods. People were secondary creatures, deprived of will, reason, sense of movement and breath. These features were only given to them by Odin, Villa and V. 
as in the sons of Buri, the father of Iasus. The change in the characteristics of people and their appearances in history takes place at the time of the appearance of the Norns, such as the giantness of the seers who gave prophecies about Ragnarok. In the fight at the end of time, people become allies of the aces or guards and in the future fight against the giants. At this moment, Odin also sends death regardless of his will and creates Valhalla, a place where fallen warriors devote themselves to training and amazing feats to face the fight on the day of Ragnarok. I really like the myth of the creation of the world that the Vikings told themselves. The setting is Ginnam Gagap, an abyss filled with ice. South of that location, there was a Musclaim land of fire ruled by Surthra, a fire giant who melted the ice with his hot breath. From the glaciers, the poisoned waters of Nilfheim, the land of darkness, mists and blizzards, came into being. In Nilfheim flowed the North River, which foamed against the glaciers but did not freeze thanks to the fiery breath of Surthra. From the foam of the waters of Iwag was born Imr, great father of the giants. The dormant Imr gave birth to a pair of both sexes, a boy named Ragamira, from whom the race of Tursans was born. Imr also gave birth to a cow, Adumla, that fed the Tursans with her milk. For three days, she licked the salt from the glacier. After three days, the oldest of the Buri Aces arose from it. He married Bestel, the daughter of the giant Baldro. From this union was born Odin Veli and Vi sons of Buri to stop Emmer's growth and the wedding of the Tursans. Their great grandfather killed them. Few of them survived the flood of blood. Odin Veli and Vi then threw the dead Emmer into the void, and from his body they created earth because it was dark and moody. They illuminated it with sparks from the forge of Zatutra, creating stars. In the center of the earth, they erected Midgard, the seat of men, and on the coast, Jotunheim, the seat of giants. The last ones were dwarfs made of tiny emmer cubes. Four dwarfs went to the corners of the world, to Austria-Westri, Saudri, and Nordri, that is, to the east, west, south, and north. The rest of the dwarfs went where they wanted, including the underground corridors of the mountains and the roots of trees, where they made other dwarfs. That's how Dwalin was born. Dwalin took some of the dwarfs to the surface and settled by the sea. The aces liked to be in Mithgard. Odin Veli and Ve saw Aske or Ash and Emle or Elam gave them a roof and life and the ability to move and reason and the senses. Thus arose men. They handed them over to Midgard and let them multiply before becoming gods to them. Then, seeing that people had settled in Midgard, they decided to build their abode. And so in central Asgard, they built their city. In Asgard grows a giant ash tree called Yggdrasil. Above it spread branches holding the whole sky. This tree has three roots that reach all the worlds. Beneath Yggdrasil is the source of Urt, a spring of pristine water whose sip gives knowledge of the future. There are also Norns living under it, watering it every day. Another root of the Yggdrasil reaches as far as Nithhel, where the Nithok serpent gnaws at it and poisons it with venom. If it wasn't for the Norns, he would wither and the whole world with him. A third route reaches Jotunheim, where Mimir sits by the miraculous spring. The sage so called because he draws water in with his horn every day and takes a sip. Odin, with his permission, drank from his cup at the cost of his eye. Also residing at Yggdrasil is the eagle, knowing all that's going on in the world. The Ratatask squirrel carrying news between the eagle, a hog, four deers and all sorts of worms gnawing at Yggdrasil, which would wither if it were not for the waters of Urt. At Yggdrasil, the gods gather to counsel the fate of the world and hold judgment. Asgard is a beautiful land of eternal spring. Within it lies a stronghold of aces called Gladschain, covered in gold. In it, the gods gather to judge and feast. There's also another hall called Wingolf for the goddesses. The plain of Asgard is called Idval. 
Before the first words of the prophecy were spoken, the Aces built the first altars and temples to teach people how to worship the gods. Here the Aces also set up a forge from which they made everything of gold. Here too they played and had feasts. In the central point there is a Hiltzkates on which Odin sits to see everything that is happening in Asgard and on Earth. Asgard is connected to Earth by means of the Bifrost Bridge, also known as the Rainbow Bridge, which is guarded by the bright god Heimdall. There is also Valhalla for fallen heroes to support the gods on the day of Ragnarok. Valhalla is all silver and has 540 doors. The walls are all made of silver-plated spears, the ceiling is made of shields, and there are armors on the tables. Every day the heroes go to fight the wolf. None of them get wounded, and in the evening they feast with Odin, by whom sit wolves, Gere and Freke, and on his shoulders the ravens of Higgin, which means reason, and Munin, which means memory. The heroes enjoy drinking honey and beer, and eating the meat of the wonderful wild boar Saichminir. This boar is seasoned and cooked every day, and incredibly comes back to life the next day. Heroes are served by Valkyries. These maidens are sent into battle to choose the warriors who will die, and then lead them through Valerin to Valhalla. Odin and Freya divide them in half. Thor, weaker than Odin, crosses the rivers to fight the Tercians. Nivhel, it is the deepest and most terrible land. It is ruled by the ghostly goddess Hel. She guards the peace of those who have not been chosen. She lives in a great and gloomy mansion, defended by walls and bars called Elendir. Inside is a hunger table called Hanga and a knife under the table called Selter. Hel is depicted as a half-corpse and half-woman, wearing a dress that inspires nausea. She rests on a core bed, which represents lethargy. The goddess brings death out of the grave and protects them from the dangers of this journey. Some who escape the goddess haunt the world as ghosts. These are burned or killed again, and the drowned are taken care of by Egir, where his nine daughters and his wife, Ran, take care of them in his abode. The greatest heroes, kings and leaders of the Scandinavian teams also go to Nivhel. Chosen by a special fate, they play and feast to receive a sign at the right time and help the gods. On the day of Ragnarok, they are not ruled by hell. Alright, now let's talk a little bit about sacrifices and rites. The Vikings did not record details of their religion or rite, and Christians describing them detracted from the value. Thus, it is difficult today to say whether literary myths reflect the real beliefs and rituals of the Vikings. Only one Viking temple, Gullum Uppsala in Sweden, has survived to our times, which in the 11th century was described by the German priest Adam of Bremen. According to his writing, this building was gilded and contained figures of three gods. In the center sat Thor with Odin and Freyr on the other side. Adam also described the attributes of these gods and believed by the Swedes. Thor controlled the air with thunderbolts and lightning, ruled the winds and storms at sea, and held a scepter in his hand for good weather and harvest. Odin ruled war and courage, and his character was armed. Freya, on the other hand, is the god of peace and physical pleasure. His character was depicted with a huge penis. Each of these gods had its priestess, and people made sacrifices to them for intentions appropriated to their fields. Adam of Bremen stated that this temple was the center of the national cult, and every nine years great celebrations were held there, in which all men from all provinces had to participate, even Christians. Further, Adam of Bremen wrote that in order to appease the gods, the males of various animals were sacrificed. And also, men's bodies of the victims were hung on trees in the sacred grove next to the temple. In the history of Norwegian kings, he describes the custom and how Odin established among the peoples of the north. Namely, he ordered that all the dead should be burnt and with them everything that they had. Everyone was to come to Valhalla with everything that was on their prior and used that was burnt on earth. The ashes were to be carried to the sea or buried in the ground and the worthy men were to be brought down with a burial mound. Three sacrifices were necessary, one at the beginning of winter for an auspicious year, another in the middle of winter for the rebirth of everything, and lastly one in the summer for a win. 
In 922, the Arab traveler Ibn Fandiyan met the Vikings. He was a scribe sent by the Caliph of Baghdad. During his stay, he witnessed the cremation ceremony of a certain Swedish chieftain, which he described along with other Viking customs. The cremation was preceded by a 10-day mourning period, during which friends and relatives of the deceased drank a liqueur named Niptach. He wrote that they drank day and night, getting drunk to the point of unconsciousness. In fact, one of them died with a cup in his hand. The chief's slave girl was to be buried with him, but she agreed to do this voluntarily. She was put under the care of a woman who drank and sang. The girl was treated as the spouse of the deceased, but was not required to preserve her virginity. Before she died, she visited the tents of several men close to the chief and had intercourse with them. As she left, each of them said, tell your spouse I did it for the love of him. Later they lifted her up three times. Each time she said that on the second side she saw her father and mother, as well as other deceased relatives, and finally her late lord, who was waiting for her in the green garden. At the very end she said, he called me, take me to him. After this the mourners led her to the stacked ship where the body of the chief lay in a tent. An old woman, who was called the Emissary of Death, came out to meet her, handed her the last cup of Niptach, and then grabbed her hand and dragged her into the tent. While the warriors were hitting shields with sticks to drown out the screams of the victims in the tent, six men entered and laid her down next to her master. Two of them held her feet and the other two held her hands. The messenger of death clamped a rope around her neck and handed its two ends to the other two men. She then drove the dagger twice between the slave's ribs and the men holding the rope pulled so hard until she died. The closest male relative of the deceased approached the prior and set it on fire. Vikings have been viewed in different ways over the centuries in England. The Viking Age began dramatically with the aforementioned invasion of Lindisfarne in 793. The devastation of this sacred island shocked and altered European medieval courts to the Vikings' presence. Never before had such an atrocity been observed, declared the scholar Al Queen of York. Medieval Christians in Europe were completely unprepared for the Viking incursions and found no explanation for their arrival and accompanying these incursions with the sufferings they experienced at their hands. They explained themselves by the wrath of God. The attack on Lindisfarne demonized perceptions of the Vikings for the next 12 centuries. It wasn't until the 1890s that scholars outside Scandinavia began to seriously assess the Vikings' achievements, recognizing their mastery of technology and nautical skills. The Vikings' 200-year influence on European history was full of tales of plunder and colonization, and most of these chronicles came from Western witnesses and their descendants. Less popular, though equally important, are the Viking chronicles that originated in the East, including those of the Dayan, the Chronicles of Novgorod, and the brief variancies of Poteus, Patriarch of Constantinople, concerning the first Viking attack on the Byzantine Empire. Other chroniclers of Viking history include Adam of Bremen, who wrote in Zealand, there was much gold accumulated by piracy. These were called Vikings by their own and Ascomans by other people. Early modern publications of Viking culture appeared in the 16th century. For example, Ola USA Magnus's History of the Northern People in 1555 and the first edition of the 13th century Gestadonorum by Saxo Grammaticus in 1514. The rate of publication increased in the 17th century with Latin transcriptions. In Scandinavia, 17th century Danish scholars Thomas Bartolini and Swede Ola Os Rudbeck used runic inscriptions and Icelandic sagas as historical sources. An important contemporary British contributor to Viking studies was George Hakes who published his Lingorum Wet, that is, a dictionary of the old northern languages in 1703 to 1705. In the 18th century, British interest and enthusiasm for Icelandic and early Scandinavian culture grew enormously, which were expressed in English translations of Old Norse texts and in original poems, praising the supposed virtues of the Vikings. The romanticization of the Viking heritage began. 
The word Viking was first popularized in the early 19th century by Eric Gustav Geyer with his poem Viking. The poem did much to promote the new ideal of the Viking, which had little basis in historical facts. The renewed interest in the Old North had contemporary political implications on the Gaitish society, of which Geyer was a member. It largely popularized the myth of another Swedish writer, Ezaja Stegner, who had a great influence on the perception of the Vikings. He wrote a modern version of the China saga from Freak to Free Boys, which became very popular in Scandinavian countries, but also in the UK and Germany. Fascination with the Vikings peaked during the so-called Viking Revival in the early 18th and 19th centuries as a branch of Romantic nationalism in Britain. This was called Serpent Realism in Germany, Wagnerian Pathos and Scandinavianism. The end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century was already the romantic idea of the Vikings. The figure of this conqueror became a well-known symbol in various political and ideological contexts in Normandy. The Viking ship also became a regional symbol. In Germany, awareness of Viking history in the 19th century was stimulated by the broader dispute with Denmark over Schleswig-Holstein, as well as Richard Wagner's use of Scandinavian mythology. The idealized view of the Vikings appealed to the Germanic powers, who transformed the figure of the Viking in accordance with the ideology of the Germanic conqueror. Vikings were portrayed in Nazi Germany as a purely Germanic type. Nordic mythology was used by the nationalism of the Third Reich, and interpretations of Viking paganism and Scandinavian use of the runes were used to build Nazi mysticism and other political organizations of the same sort, such as the Norwegian fascist party National Samling. Similarly, they appropriated elements of the modern myth of Viking culture, its symbolism, and propaganda. Modern popular culture highlighted the Viking idea, starting with German composer Richard Wagner's opera The Ring of the Nibelung, novels directly based on historical events such as Franz Gunnar Bentken's Langskips, and historical fantasies like the movie Vikings, Death Eaters, and the comedy film Eric the Viking. The vampire Eric Northman from the HBO series True Blood was a Viking prince before he was turned into a vampire. Vikings appear in several books by Danish writer Paul Anderson. He is the author of a 2005 trilogy of the novels about a young Viking traveler, Torgel. In 1962, American comic book writer Stan Lee and his brother Larry Lieber created the Marvel superhero Thor, whose creators based him on the Norse god of the same name. The character is featured in the 2011 Marvel Studios film titled Thor and its sequels. The character also appears in the 2012 film The Avengers and in the animated series. The appearance of Vikings in popular media and television has seen a resurgence in recent decades, most notably in the History Channel series Vikings, directed by Michael Hurst. The series is loosely based on fact and historical sources, but relies more on literary resources just like the sagas, although many historical events are also covered in the series. The Vikings series is pioneering as it supports the novel idea of the shield woman or woman warriors. The idea was denied for a long time in history and it is only in recent years that it has gained support. When there is a buzz about a topic, myths around it grow. It is no different with the Vikings. I will now try to dispel some of the most popular myths about the Vikings. I will start with the most well-known myth, the explanation of which often results in the proliferation of other historical inaccuracies. Did the Vikings wear helmets with horns? The simple answer is no. There is no representation of warrior Viking helmets and no surviving helmet that has horns. The Vikings' style of close quarter combat in shield walls or on ships would have made horned helmets cumbersome and dangerous to the warrior's own side. Historians also believe that Viking warriors did not wear horned helmets. Whether such helmets were used in Scandinavian culture for other ritual purposes is still unknown. So where did this misunderstanding about horned helmets come from? It comes in part from 19th century enthusiasts of the Gothic Bedform, an organization founded in Stockholm in 1811. 
It promoted the use of Norse mythology as a subject for high art and for other moral and ethical purposes. It depicted Vikings with winged helmets and other garments taken from classical antiquity, particularly images of Norse gods. This was done to legitimize the Vikings and their mythology, linking it to the classical world, which was idealized in European culture. Individual horned helmets were probably used for ceremonial purposes. True Viking helmets were cone-shaped, made of wood, metal and leather. Reinforcements for the commander were reserved for an iron helmet with a mask. Were the Vikings unhygienic? This myth has lingered in popular culture since the release of the 1999 film 13th Warrior. The scene depicts an Arab traveler expressing disgust towards the Viking custom of washing oneself before a meal in a single bowl circulated around the table. Interestingly, this custom actually originated in Arab circles, where less wealthy hosts would offer guests the opportunity to wash their hands in a single vessel. The order of use was that the host would wash first before dinner and then dip their hands in the bowl last after the meal. The truth, however, is that the Scandinavians were famous for their love of bathing. They also enjoyed various types of water sports, such as swimming races and water wrestling. So they undoubtedly bathed more often than the inhabitants of large European cities. As I also mentioned, combs and hair ornaments are known to have been found, which shows that the Scandinavians took care of their hairstyles. The famous Norwegian king, Harold the Beautiful Haired, earned his nickname just by combing his hair. Did the Vikings use skulls as a drinking vessel? There is no evidence for this. It was a misunderstanding based on a passage in a poem by Krakumel talking about heroes drinking from the branches of skulls. It was actually about drinking from horns, but it was mistranslated in the 17th century. When one thinks of Vikings, the first image that comes to mind is that of barbarians prowling, ravaging, and plundering the coasts of Northern Europe. This, as you already know, is a very false image. The Vikings gave the world a lasting legacy. In addition to their ability to read, understand politics and agriculture, the Vikings were also people who traveled around the world on boats, which could only be accomplished through knowledge of the stars and planets and mathematics. In other words, the Vikings also knew the science to cross the oceans on a global scale, to explore and trade on boats that could also serve as warships. The Vikings must have known much more than how to inflict suffering. And they did know. The truth is that the Vikings gave as much to the world as the Greeks and Romans. Thank you very much for your attention. I would appreciate you sharing this podcast with your family and friends. If you enjoyed the podcast, leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more.